Um, my name is Emily Bell. I'm director of the Tao Centre for Digital Journalism at Columbia. Um, over on the East Coast, we share a rather magnificent digital space on campus with something called the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. Uh, and the sister organisation, our institute, is here at Stanford Engineering. Um, and so I want to say thank you to Director uh, Manish uh, Agrawala for having us here in the first place. Um, and also, I just wanted to introduce him so he can tell you a couple of things about the uh, Brown Institute. Great. Uh, thank you, Emily. So um, first, I wanted to say welcome to Stanford, to all of you. Uh, I'm wondering how many of you are from not from this area? OK, great. Uh, how many of you have been to Stanford before? OK, welcome. Welcome once again. Um, OK, is this? Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, and how many of you have heard of the Brown Institute? Okay, so have maybe half of you. So I'll just do a, a quick description of what the Brown Institute is. So uh, I am Manisha Agrawala, as Emily said. I am the director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation here at Stanford. I'm also a professor of computer science at Stanford. Um, and the Brown Institute was established in 2012 as a joint institute between uh, Columbia, at Columbia in the School of Journalism. There's a half of the Brown Institute, and the other half <laughs> is located here at Stanford in the School of Engineering. I direct the half that's here at Stanford. Mark Hansen, who many of you probably know, directs the half that's at Columbia. And uh, as Emily alluded to, uh, we are very fortunate to also have the Tau Center housed in the same uh, uh, set of rooms and area of the Institute in New York. Uh, so it's a very close collaboration, and one of the reasons for that is that we share some of the same missions for our <coughs> institutes. The Brown Institute uh, was established with a gift from Helen Gurley Brown. Uh, as many of you know, she was the longtime editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine. She made the magazine what it is today. Um, she uh, left the uh, gift endowing the institute uh, in the name of her husband, David Brown, who had been an undergraduate at Stanford and then went on to Columbia Journalism School, was a well-known journalist and also a uh, well-known film producer. Um, and uh, the mission of the Brown Institute is really to support new and innovative ways to tell stories. So we support projects that are aimed at developing new storytelling techniques and also new storytelling technologies. And uh, the primary thing that we do is give money to students, uh, and in some cases alumni, to uh, put together these storytelling projects. The other thing that we do is uh, think a lot about how media uh, uh, should be, how media should work <laughs> in the 21st century. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm super excited that we have this event here today, because I think uh, digital archives of news is very, very important, particularly the issues about how to uh, digitize it and also to provide access to it. Um, I just wanted to really thank not just Manish, but uh, the, de the uh, uh, Deputy Director Anne Grimes of the Brown Institute, who's over there, um, and Kelly, who is at the back there, um, who've just been terrific partners in setting this all up. Uh, and I wanted to thank the Tau team, not least uh, Marichelle uh, Rojasalas out there at the back with the uh, long lens. Um, don't worry, we're just, we're going to, we, this is, we, we'll be taking your pictures for archival purposes only. Um, uh, and um, I also wanted to say that this meeting here today is part of an ongoing program that we've been running for two years at the Tau Center uh, called Platforms and Publishers. Uh, and when we started it two years ago, the idea was tech power uh, and particularly large platforms were playing an increase, we thought were playing an increasing role in the public sphere and in journalism. 
um, and it raised a number of challenges and questions for journalism. We thought this was an interesting research topic about three years ago, uh, and of course it sort of, as it were, um, we, the good news was it, it, it sort of blew up to be one of the biggest stories in the world today. The bad news for us as a research centre was it blew up to be one of the biggest stories in the world today. So we've had um, two very sort of interesting years of, of looking at digital practice uh, and how it's affect, affecting journalism. This is a series of meetings which are for full disclosure, um, supported by our funders. Um, this track is principally uh, supported by the uh, MacArthur Foundation, we also have support from the Knight Foundation uh, and the Open Societies Foundation and the Abrams Foundation as well. We're not funded in any part at all by the tech industry. I always like to say that because at some point somebody will always accuse me, usually on Twitter, of being funded by Google, but we're not. Um, and these, these discussions really are helping us to formulate and think about um, both further research projects but also policy and, and issues <coughs> that don't normally get talked about in interdisciplinary groups. Uh, and it's really thrilling for me today to have a group of people who just don't normally talk to each other uh, coming here, which are the archivists uh, and the journalists and the technologists, to tackle this really thorny problem, um, digitization and preservation of the news archive. And this program was entirely put together by two of our PhD students, uh, Sharon Ringel and Angela Woodall. Uh, where are you? There they are, um, who are here, who are conducting a broader um, research project into the archive and digitization, particularly in news organizations. So if any of you have um, an interest in that or something to tell them, please catch hold of them um, at the break and introduce yourselves. Uh, and without more ado, I want to get into the first conversation. I'm really thrilled to have here um, two people who fortunately know each other, so hopefully this can be a, a, a pretty kind of fluid conversation, um, which is Mark Graham uh, of the Internet Archive, just up the road, um, and Jake Olivitz of the Wikimedia Foundation, um, also, again, a West Coast organisation. Uh, now... Um, I want you to just to introduce a little bit um, about what you both do uh, and what your backgrounds are and what you brought you here. Um, and really what we're hoping to do in this opening conversation is just frame some of the issues and challenges that we'll hear um, discussed and thrashed out in more detail um, throughout the afternoon. Uh, so why don't you start, Mark, with sure. your... So, so you're, you're, in, you, you're actually in charge of the thing that was described in Congress this week as... The memory grabbing. Yeah, so uh, Senator, Senator Attilis, Republican of North Carolina, said, uh, Thank goodness mm. for the Wayback and other memory grabbing machines. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, not as good as uh, Rachel Maddow's, uh, thank God for the Internet Archive, thank God for the Wayback, uh, International Treasure. But we'll, we'll, we'll take both. Um, indeed, I, so I manage the Wayback machine uh, at the Internet Archive uh, up in San Francisco. And I'll just uh, get it out of the way. We have an open lunch every Friday, so you're all invited. Uh, just contact me ahead of time, and uh, we'll, we'll set it up. So it's, uh, it's happening right, right now up in San Francisco. And uh, it was started 21 years ago by a guy named Brewster Kale, who had made a fair amount of money um, in the tech industry. Uh, actually sold a company called Alexa to uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon. And, uh, and he dedicated his life and his fortune to the pursuit of universal access to all knowledge. <clears throat> kind of fairly highfalutin kind of set of goals. Uh, but uh, within that, we do a variety of uh, digitization, archiving, and library services. Uh, uh, the one that I manage is the Wayback Machine, which is principally about uh, backing up as much of the public web as is reasonably possible and making it available to people. The mission statement for the Wayback Machine is to help make the web more useful and reliable. Super briefly about myself, I started my first uh, internet online service in 1984, uh, a computer network for peace activists up in Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, uh, building and running online services and internet operations ever since then. Uh, I joined the Internet Archive two and a half years ago, and before that I was a senior vice president with NBC News Digital. So you've seen it from both sides of the both sides of the aisle. A whole lot of it? sides. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. Jake, tell us how you ended up at Wikimedia and what and what you do there. Uh, so I was a political theory major. I'm one of the few Wikipedians who got into the project because I was just astounded by how impressive the policy pages and rules were about how the community governs itself. 
Uh, it was my entry point to working just as a volunteer, um, writing articles about um, everything from medicine to uh, revolutions. And of particular importance to me was uh, writing about the Arab Spring uh, as, it was ha as the Egyptian Revolution was unfolding in 2011. And that was my first real experience of Wikipedia as, um, we don't like to use the term news in the encyclopedia right. context, but <laughs> Wikipedia was acting in some ways as a breaking news context, and I was one of a couple editors deeply involved with that. Um, and a couple years uh, went by, and my mission became helping other editors get access to research, so much of which academic scholarly research, newspapers, journals, magazines, is behind paywalls. And our editors are not affiliated with an institution. They don't necessarily have access to a library. So the program that I founded is called the Wikipedia Library. And uh, it has a digital library component where we've partnered with 70 publishers around the world. And we ha our editors uh, can get access to 100,000 journals for free. And um, that's a partnership that so, so, so it would come as a surprise, well it came as a surprise to me to realise that uh, Wikimedia actually has a library or even needs a library. So what, what, was the, what was the thinking behind that? Because Mark is at a place which is entirely devoted to the sure. idea of archiving what others have done. And yeah. with Wik Wikipedia you would think, well it's all there, what's, what's the archive for? Um, so the reason Wikipedia lead, needs a library is because our editors are uh, amateur, although quite talented researchers. Um, and the, the way that Wikipedia works, although the public often experiences Wikipedia as a take-it-as-it-is product, the, in the process of constructing and producing that knowledge, we rely entirely on pre-vetted, qualified sources. So we're a tertiary source. We limit ourselves to not make the kinds of distinctions about editorial judgment or what is true or not true. We simply summarize what good sources say. And so having access to those sources is essential. It's like the, you know, the the bullets that editors go into right. war with. You know, if they don't have access to those sources, um, then they can't produce quality research, and they certainly can't produce up-to-date research. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the challenges that, that we're facing in the idea of sort of online archiving. So one of the reasons that we wanted to do this, this session <coughs> and, and talk to experts in this space was, as we were talking to a whole range of new types of new organi news organization. In the olden days, I, I worked at The Guardian for 20 years um, in London, and I thrill my journalism students now by describing the days in which you would research a story by going into the sort of bowels of your own building and taking out a file which looks a bit like this one, full of pieces of paper cut up, usually your own newspaper, it has to be said, not mm -hmm. anybody else's, uh, and you would take the file of cut up pieces of news out, uh, and that was, your, that was your starting of your research which always kind of blows uh, the 25-year-old's minds so, who say, how did you ever manage to research anything or publish anything, and how was it ever right? And the answer was, we didn't publish very much, and often it was wrong. Um, but the, <laughs> but the uh, don't, don't tweet that. Uh, but, the, uh, the, but the challenge now, with what we're finding with new news organizations as well, is that um, it's almost like what we do with the exhaust of the digital sort of production process um, isn't often <coughs> thought about at all. Uh, what's the kind of, what's, what's both of your, th Mark, what's your thinking on this? Because, you know, you, you have this reputation now as being the thing that grabs everything off mm -hmm. the internet. You are right. the last resort of archiving. Yeah. Um, or one of the last resorts of, of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of archiving. What's right. the challenge that you face with all of this new publishing and publication that you have to catch. Sure. Oh, there's lots of challenges. Um, but I'll also say that, that if you go back to like the, the, the publishers themselves, like you know, many of them, most of them, aren't doing archiving uh, for a variety of reasons, even though in the print media there's been a long tradition of it, as you said. In fact, going back to the 1800s, where the postal service would actually uh, provide free postage for any newspaper to send their newspaper to other newspapers. So it was a very common practice for newspapers to get dozens of newspapers every day. So we have that, that history and that carried forward. But in the digital world, as, as many of us were, were building these online publishing platforms within traditional news organizations, uh, for all, there's a number of factors. Many of them were set up for separate divisions with separate budgets, separate priorities, have uh, quarterly uh, profit objectives, uh, constantly dealing with uh, technology that's not meeting their needs, chasing the new technology that's going to solve all of their problems, 
shifting from one content management system to the next content management systems. And nowhere in that equation do you have kind of a sensibility or a priority to say, uh, we need to be preserving all of this material and somehow making it available and useful to people. And so I'm not saying it's like a, you know, it's like grand plan to not do that. It's more a matter of like an afterthought, simply not a business priority. So, so at least uh, I'll speak to the, the Wayback Machine and what we try to do at, at the Internet Archive is in particular uh, with regard to news. So we're currently archiving about 1.5 billion URLs a week. Uh, and within that, uh, we're currently archiving about 150 million news-related URLs. Um, my goal is to simply archive all of the news. Uh, maybe I'll exclude sports and weather, something like that, right? So, um, so start with the goal. I want to archive all of the news. And uh, I think we're doing an okay job of it right now. Um, love to talk in detail with anyone here who might think they can help us do it better because I'm, I'm here to share and to participate in trying to help improve the practice of what many of us are involved in. Uh, but some of the practical considerations would be things like, um, as Jake mentioned, paywalls. Uh, you know, when, um, when uh, Bolton was announced a couple weeks ago, my first thought was, didn't he write an article in the Wall Street Journal? arguing f uh, for the legal justification for a first strike on North Korea. And uh, he had, so I Googled it, uh, and it came up, it was behind a paywall. Now I happen to give $32 a month to the Wall Street Journal, uh, so I could have logged in and read the article, but I thought to myself, how about, every, how about all the other millions of Americans who deserve access to this vital information as part of a national debate? So I went to the Wayback Machine, we had 142 copies of that URL. Uh, and I started looking through them. Most of them were, were, were copies of a paywalled archive of that article. But I found one that wasn't. Uh, and, uh, and then I tweeted it and I shared that out. So paywalls is, is an issue. Even being aware that a publication exists is an issue. Uh, the format, the media is an issue. Huffington Post has been running this great uh, uh, ad campaign for Hulu uh, about uh, perspectives. Maybe some of you have seen it. It was like a full page uh, ad basically showing uh, articles where they lived on the political spectrum, uh, political spectrum, but there's a back end to it and there's a front end to it and it doesn't archive very well. It's not just like a clean HTML page. So there's issues about the media itself that you're trying to archive. There's a variety of other issues. Right, right. Yeah. Well, one of the other issues, I yeah. guess, is, is variety of sources. So, you know, I, I hate to mention um, the thing that wakes me up every morning, which is the president's Twitter feed, because uh, I, I, I took the rather sort of stupid step of setting up an alert for every time he tweets, thinking this will be a rare and unusual event, but um, not, not so. Uh, but it's a very effective alarm, actually, 6 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, but, but something like that, Jake, is now that, that sort of, sort of so that's, that's almost like some, I've heard uh, 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 researchers describe it as state-controlled social media. Um, is that a new source? How do, we, how do you parse the different sources when you're looking at those kind of, um, how, how you connect those to Wikipedia and what, what, what counts? Sure. Um, I want to start off just uh, in reference to Wikipedia as an archive in and of itself. Right. This is an interesting uh, aspect of Wikipedia that every single edit and change is recorded and is available in the history. So Wikipedia is a, a not just an encyclopedia and a summary of human knowledge, but it's an archive of its own evolution. Mm -hmm. So we start from that, and that helps us do things like ask uh, how have things changed and to adjust based on uh, what the sources are telling us. Um, one of the three core policies of Wikipedia, one of those pillars that got me attracted in the first place, is called verifiability. And it's this notion, very familiar to the journalism sphere, that if you make a claim, someone else should be able to check it and see that it's true. Now, not necessarily check it easily, but in theory, they could check it. Um, and so the, the corollary to that is they have to be able to, to look it up and see that it came from a source with a reputation for fact checking and accuracy. So we have this guiding principle when we evaluate sources. Even as the landscape of sources have sh has shifted, even as social media has become much more prominent, we, even if, uh, through the rise of, of the blogosphere, um, we still have this, this guiding principle that we evaluate each source in the context of the claim that's being made for uh, is, it, is it an appropriate source with a reputation for fact-checking and accuracy mm -hmm. to make that claim? So if the president tweets um, and makes a claim about uh, history, for example, um, our current president, um, we would not consider that 
in most cases, a reliable source for that information. The president's tweets are a reliable source for what the president himself said. Right. So we often make that distinction. Essentially, social media often acts as, um, often acts as a primary source um, or a source that can only speak to, to its own uh, credibility. But even that has changed as more journalists right. now uh, and politicians make major announcements on Twitter. And so what we'll end up doing is we'll link to uh, the, the tweet as kind of the, the primary source, right. but then we'll add the context that a secondary news article provided um, so that, because again, we're not supposed to be telling the news narrative ourselves. So we, we use the tweet as to illustrate what the newspaper right. article is. Is talking so, so, about. So, so that's a fascinating point, which again is, you know, so, sort of the, the, the origin of the source has changed. So, that, so, and particularly in politics, which is, I guess, maybe the most important, is it the most important area where we really need a permanent record of what's happened? I, I noted that um, after Mark Zuckerberg's hearing, uh, hearings on Capitol Hill last week, that lots of the uh, Congress people and senators who asked him questions then followed up their questions with contextualization, et cetera, with pretty lengthy posts on their own Facebook feeds, mm. which is a very right. sort of meta problem of where you have the, sort of the commentary. Uh, and I, I did think, so, so who archives that? Now, are we moving into a phase where the big platforms have a duty to archive? Do they, you know, do, 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 are, they, are they going to be the people who ultimately take over yeah. your role? Can we trust them to do that? So let, here's a concrete example that I'm right. going to hand over to Mark, because if um, Mark Zuckerberg or um, a politician makes a claim on Facebook, we very, mel very well may want to link to that as a source. But Facebook is not reliable as an archive. Right. Um, and so we have a problem because links on Wikipedia go dead all the time. We right. had this huge issue uh, with 404 errors where you know, something may be theoretically verifiable, but if the URL directing a reader to that page is dead, is broken, um, no longer currently exists or has moved, it's a big problem for ease of verification in a practical sense. So um, we formed a collaboration actually with uh, Mark in the Wayback Machine mm -hmm. to uh, archive and restore, uh, I think it's 4 million so far, yeah, yeah. Uh, links that had died and right. to replace them with a link to the nearest, uh, in, in terms of date proximity, the nearest copy that the Wayback Machine had of right. that URL. So basically we tried to repair the public record where it had been broken. Now we're moving toward a more proactive role where we're working with, with the Wikimedia Foundation and others to, uh, to make it such that the web itself is versioned the web itself is born archived uh, and that references that are made are references to content at a given point in time and not just references to an address. But what you're speaking to is really the shifting nature of like what is news, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it used to be relatively simple, uh, but, but now uh, I'm not suggest that news is like, you know, whatever information humans are experiencing that help them to understand what's real and important in the world. And by many accounts today, that's Facebook as the dominant source of that quote unquote news. Uh, and so, uh, so ever more so the importance of uh, archiving and making available uh, for, for, for researchers and for analysis, uh, that which is shared via public, uh, via social media in the public is, is important. And it's important not just to be able to look at a specific claim, like a specific post, that's important, but also to be able to look at the aggregate uh, to be able to look at, at what is being said in the context of everything else that's being said. Uh, so, you know, one tweet by one influencer that may or may not be a real human, that may not be a state actor, may have some significance, but there's a thousands of them going on on 15 different platforms over a period of like 36 hours with one particular theme. That's a completely different kind of, of a story. So uh, over the last few years, we've been shifting more of our resources at the Internet Archive into archiving uh, social media. Now, we're fairly large, we have a fair amount of resources, but it's like a teeny amount relative to the task at hand. Right. We archive somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 YouTube videos a week, for example. Uh, there's maybe that many vid YouTube videos published every few minutes. So it's a, a fraction. In that regard, we do things like, we look for uh, signals. So we, we monitor a lot of, t of uh, Twitter accounts, for example, and look for references to web pages and look for references in YouTube videos to try to figure out where we should kind of focus some of our efforts. I just want to say too, um, 
that in addition to archiving uh, web-based uh, information, and web, uh, we also archive other media type. And so uh, relevant to this conversation, most notably is television news. Uh, Roger McDonald, my colleague, is in the background here. He manages the television news archive at the Internet Archive. And we currently archive about 60 news channels, and we've been doing that for about nine years, and we have more than a million hours of television news with closed caption, which means it's searchable, uh, and we're now doing optical character recognition on the chirons. Uh, so we're basically taking what used to be um, a kind of an, 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 an inherently ephemeral, uh, isolated kind of experience and, um, and turning it into data so that you can begin to do analysis on what's being shared in this linear, fairly ephemeral format called television news. Well, this is a, so, so this idea of, as you say, the sort of the shifting landscape and what is news. Um, you know, which I, I'm not going to. Yeah, I am going to mention the words fake news because they're everywhere. Uh, but this idea of um, sources. Can, can you both talk, um, Jake? Maybe start with you about how you deal with that problem of shifting news sources and what's a reliable news source and what's not a reliable news source. Because I, you know, pages now proliferate at an alarming <laughs> rate that often look like pretty credible news sources and they're set up as news media properties and it's only some way down the line you discover that in fact they're not qu quite what they seem. And that's where something like the Internet Internet Research Agency set up in Russia is actually mm -hmm. remarkably good at producing things that look like not very good news websites. So, um, Yeah, I think that's uh, an ongoing challenge. Um, we have a guideline called Identifying Reliable Sources that helps us do that. We have a community notice board called the Reliable Sources Notice Board where we talk about these issues. But you can see it um, you know, first from, from the perspective of an outsider who's trying to evaluate, is this a good source or not? Um, Wikipedia is becoming a source, not just information, but in particular, a source about sources. Right. Um, and that's the way that in just the past uh, two weeks, it's been used um, very prominently by Facebook and YouTube, who now... Um, without, without asking you, is that right or not? We had no prior <laughs> knowledge, that's correct. No prior knowledge. So, so, so just to explain, this is both Facebook and uh, Google, or well, YouTube, uh, validating, if you like, their own material by adding Wikipedia stubs to stories. So, so in the spirit of Wikipedia, which is freely licensed under a Creative Commons CC BY SA license with an open API, you can pull and use and share and even commercialize and sell all of our content. So what, what was done was entirely within the licensing right. rights. It might have been nice to get a little bit of a heads up. Our, our editor community, for example, you know, noticed an influx of uh, traffic um, to articles about news sources. Because on Facebook now, there's a little eye in a circle. And if you click on it, it will pop up, for example, and tell you that Breitbart is a far right wing news source that is often intentionally misleading. And that's coming directly from the Wikipedia page. Um, right, so to, and, and, and there is, you, you are probably the most practiced people at having kind of troll attacks or, or, or kind of coordinate, not even trolls, coordinated kind of lobby, online lobbying to change pages. This is presumably going to affect that workflow, I would have thought. So um, the, the, the good news is, is that we've, we're a tar sorry, the bad news is that we are a target for trolls and agenda pushers. Um, of all types. Uh, the good news is, is we've been like that since the very beginning. In fact, uh, a way that Clay Shirky describes achieving <laughs> neutrality is not having one righteous person who sticks the pole straight in the sand and it stands up, but you have people with differing, even oppositional attitudes pushing from all directions, and that's what keeps the pole straight. And that's one of the ways that in a, an open crowdsource community you can get better less biased content with people of opposing views. But what you're describing in this case is people with uh, single issues or people with an intent to troll or vandalize. And we've been dealing with them so much, we've actually, so a lot of people don't know this, but um, an edit on Wikipedia, people will say that, oh, you know, anyone can edit Wikipedia, therefore don't trust it. Well, this is some, some people say this. Everyone uses it, but some people say you shouldn't trust it. Um, but an edit on Wikipedia, actually, it first goes through a couple hundred edit filters that do natural language processing and automatically kicks out uh, 
text with certain patterns. For example, a mass deletion of content or a lot of words that a teenager might say on the internet. Um, it just automatically kicks those out. I need one of those filters for my own household. <laughs> so like... Well, it's called ClueBot. No. Um, so, but then there is this, there's a machine learning bot that is run, run based off of a neural network um, algorithm called ClueBot. And within the first uh, five to 10 seconds of an edit being posted, it will compare the attributes of that new edit to millions uh, or to a model based on millions of edits that have come before it and right. can predict within 98% accuracy that this is likely vandalism. Um, you know, so a lot of these efforts are resolved uh, and those bots are maintained and overseen by volunteers in our community. They're subject to, to approval. They're assistance tools. Um, it's not that robots are doing the editing, right. so to speak. But um, you know, that's before it even hits the eyes of an editor. Yeah. Um, so we have these defenses. And the simplest thing that we do in cases of popular articles is there's a way to protect pages. So Wikipedia is free for anyone to edit. But there are different levels of page protection. So for example, a semi-protected page, um, you have to log in to edit it. And you have to have had an account for four days and made 10 edits on it. Whereas a fully protected page, um, you might have to be an administrator and have received special community rights to edit right. it. So it's, not, it, it's fairly trivial as a problem to simply semi-protect the uh, 200 news sources that are now in Facebook's review scheme. That's, that's an easy problem for us to solve. Um, we try not to protect pages as much as possible, but certain pages just are constant targets of vandalism. And so it simply makes sense to say, you know, for the foreseeable future, we can't leave this page open. Um, right. You right. Know, uh, until it dies down, at least. So, so in this, um, you know, in this world of, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the types of different sources we haven't talked about, though, you know, you only have to look at YouTube or Facebook or or any of the um, free publishing sort of tool models. That is that lots of people kind of publish just themselves. You know, kind of like the, like the influencer networks or self-publishing is not just restricted to. Um, you know, one or two areas, it, it's now sort of some of the most influential people in news on Facebook are people who don't necessarily belong to news organizations or aren't necessarily journalists. Yeah. Um, are these things, how, how, how do your organizations make decisions <coughs> about when, when, when is the point at which you decide to change the kinds of source you'll look at or consider? Yeah. And do you have any examples where you've done that? Yeah, so, um, so a, a few things. But going back to the fake news, and it feeds into this a little bit, the quote unquote fake, fake news, is that we're an archive, we operate as a library. So uh, I have the luxury, therefore, of not having to make decisions like, like this or make judgments. I mean, I just try to get everything uh, and present uh, the public record, try to preserve it and present the, the public record. Um, and, uh, and so I, I generally don't make so much decisions about what not to get. I, I really just try to, like, do as much as I can, my, my team, to get as much as we can, and maybe focus on certain areas. So a couple years ago, I did decide to begin to focus on quote unquote fake news. And so I built a collection. It's got about 900 million URLs in it right now. Uh, and it's publicly available. If there's any researchers that want to use it as a data set to you know, train an AI or something like that, they might find it useful. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's also a matter of, uh, say, the, the, once again, the public record, and the public record changes and so as, as a library and as a reference source, um, people can use us to help uh, verify things. Like for example, two weeks ago, there was this uh, story of the New York Times that came out like about one o'clock in the morning and it was, it was about uh, Boz and about at, at Facebook and there's some claims in it that were made and, and relative to the just, show. Just for people not from the West Coast, he Sorry. is a He's senior, a senior executive, executive at Facebook, Facebook and he was, was making an argument yeah. why, in fact, yes, yeah, some people are going to get killed in the process of us right. building our business, right. but as long as we connect more people, it's kind of going to worth it in the end. And I'm not going to debate that, but, but the point is he made that argument and or he had made it in a company meeting and mm -hmm. it was leaked. And there was an article about it and the article uh, referenced Sheryl Sandberg. Mm -hmm. And then a few hours later, the article was edited in the New York Times, um, as is normal, right? Stories change. But that, a, a key part of the article was moved farther down, um, down the uh, page. Or, and, and there was this fairly uh, prolific uh, Twitter stream that went out about 
Facebook is so powerful, they can even get the New York Times to rewrite their story. Right. And they suggested that there had been a material change in the, in the story. And in fact, my read of it, at least, is that that wasn't true. There really wasn't a material change. But we had, the point is, we had like 15 versions of that story from like 1 a.m. until about 8 o'clock in the morning. And people were able to go in and go, oh, no, actually, here's what was said and here's what was changed. So we work with organizations like EDGY, Environmental Data Governance Initiative, the Sunlight Foundation, that, who's, who's here, on helping to do things like uh, identify, track, and publish changes in principally, in this context, government websites. So there's maybe an example where right. you know, I decided to put some of the hours of my time into working and supporting EDGY and Sunlight, mm -hmm. and maybe not Breitbart. But if Breitbart came to us, you know, I might help them as well to try to help set the record straight. Right. What's the, what, what practices, so, so the reliable, if you like, you, you guys can be helped, it seems to me, by news organizations or even individual journalists just being slightly better oh, yeah. at their own archiving practices. What, 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 are, what advice <coughs> or what could we learn from your models in terms of what are the sorts of things? Because it's not, it has to be set a huge priority in news and yet every day when you know, as, as journalism is un, under more and more pressure to prove a kind of a, a, a level of transparency yeah. in its own work, actually what's in the archive becomes really important to the value of your current work. Um, I think it's a, a fusion of what we do in Wikipedia for our own articles, what Mark does for the web. Um, I would like to be able to go to a news site and not just say this story was updated to XXX, but have a slider and just move it and see the article change in real time. Um, there's no reason that that couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, Wikipedia has no credentialed vetting body that determines uh, the truth or falsity of claims. What we have is a, a radically transparent process that anyone can verify for themselves. That's what permits us to achieve any kind of reliability. Um, news organizations generally trade more in the reputation of uh, their masthead. Right. You know, and, but there's no reason that, um, that an article can't um, allow you to see its evolution. I think increasingly in a world, you know, ironically, where, where <laughs> privacy is less available or perhaps less valued, transparency is currency. Transparency gets you credibility. And so, yes, it's great to say this article has been updated, but it's even better to be open and to show this is exactly how it changed. And I think that helps people also understand that even breaking news is, even a news alert is, is an evolving Right, you know. right. Well, that's, I mean, news alerts is a whole other thing. We did yeah, a big yeah. study on news alerts um, just a, a few months ago. And often, I mean, it's so hard to collect data on, partly because, you know, if you're like me, your news alerts can actually be, you know, your news headlines of the day. Mm -hmm. But you may not even sort of touch your phone or, or open an alert and then the headlines change throughout the day. H how do you, do you keep up with that? Is this, does this fall into the category of things that we're just not going to bother to keep, Mark? Uh, potentially. I mean, I mean, archives don't keep everything, right? They always make choices. Of, and uh, so we, are, we archive three or 4,000 URLs a second, so we're obviously not getting a whole lot of stuff. And as I already mentioned, a lot of social media we're not getting. So we are actually trying to identify you know, the key voices, the sources, maybe governments, maybe NGOs, et cetera, mm -hmm. journalists um, that are doing that. But you, you hit on a, a two key words, and then, you know, one, the transparency, and as we evolve our tools, we can, uh, uh, we can make tools that help people see information in context and, um, and, and, and with a degree of transparency. We have a, a, a tool which we're experimenting with in the Wayback Machine. So we have a, we have a, a browser extension. So there's an extension for Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and Safari called Wayback Machine. Uh, and there's a feature in this extension where if you're on any web page in the Wayback Machine, you can press a button and then you can see tweets that have referenced that web page. Um, so we're experimenting with that uh, as a larger experiment about uh, being a, people, giving people tools to be able to see things that they're finding on the web within a context. I mentioned earlier the context of when a message is shared on one platform that's useful, but what's more useful is the totality of every platform in the world in all medias and how that's shared. We're also experimenting with some interfaces that allow people to take a given, let's, we'll call it a story, and be able to look at that story from multiple perspectives. 
maybe a different uh, media type, or against time, or a different language, or from a different geography, or from a different source. So you begin to like understand that, in fact, there's a variety of ways that you can begin to understand something. So I, the, I guess the, the point here is that, um, that you know, this has been the story of, of media in general, but certainly of the internet. I remember 30 years ago, people said, oh my god, you know, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Mm. It hasn't really changed. The fire hoses just keep changing. But what does happen continuously is that uh, industry and others continue to build more and better tools to help all of us make sense of it and, and make it uh, more useful for ourselves. And, and then ultimately, in the topic that we're talking about today, to be, be of public benefit. I mean, I think that's critically important um, that what we're talking about here is helping us collectively do a better job of getting along with each other and living productive lives and, um, and not just you know, this individual effort of trying to uh, you know, acquire fact, but to really make better decisions. So we've got a couple of minutes left for questions. If everyone has a question, raise your hands. Um, oh, excellent. That's very quick. There's, there's one over there. I have, I have and one over here, uh, and then one over there. But if we start um, over here. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, we have a, Kelly has a microphone. And if you just say very briefly who you are as well, so. Uh, my, is it on? It is on. Okay. My name is Debbie Abelock, and I'm co-founder of a company called Noodle Tools. Um, I'm interested in uh, the making choices. We all know that all archives make choices, and when we look at certain archives or look at the past archiving, we recognize that there are always screaming silences. Um, wh wh how do you, um, how are you handling um, the way that you make choices? Are, is that information transparent and where can we look at it? And you know, all of those questions. That's a great question. So a short answer, a longer, so I'm happy to talk to people about that individually. Um, I was just reflecting yesterday with some researchers that uh, I need to write a, a fairly large post about this. Uh, there's been a little bit written about it. I'll say uh, that there are literally 6,000 different uh, sources of sources right now. Uh, so there's a, a lot of process in place. Uh, the, it's, an, it's an ever, it's an evolving um, process, but I mean, much of them are like usual suspects. Top, mon, uh, li, various lists, top million of this, top million of that. Uh, feeds from various organizations, news organizations and others. Uh, crowdsourced, uh, there's uh, about 100 million URLs were archived last week by people just entering the URL into the Wayback Machine. People and robots entering the URLs into the Wayback Machine. Uh, so there are, uh, we have 600 partners uh, at the Internet Archive, these are institutions, libraries, museums, governments, etc., um, that pay us money on a subscription basis to do web archiving on their behalf. So, uh, you know, before all I know, the Brown Institute and the Toast Center have accounts with us and create their own seed lists. And those seed lists are generated oftentimes by domain experts. Uh, so uh, there's a you know a wide variety, and uh, it's the, I would say. The process right now is not fully documented in a transparent fashion overall. I will say, however, that in the last two years, I introduced a feature on the Wayback Machine called Provenance, where for every given archive, you can click on a link on the top right-hand side of the playback page of that given URL, and you can see why we have it in the archive. Uh, and uh, we can see the organization that sponsored it, you know, the particular crawl, as we call it, that was responsible for capturing it at a technical level. Is there a problem when, um, sorry, I should actually let the audience ask a question. I'll come back to my question in a minute. I'll go to this one first, sorry. Hi, I'm Ray Pun, a librarian from Fresno State. My question is about um, ethnic newspapers. Um, for instance, in Fresno, we have um, Hmong and Cambodian newspapers that are not necessarily digitized or mainstreamed, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts on those. Thank you. I just quick answer is there is a project to uh, digitize and make available quote unquote ethnic newspapers. And, and, and publications, uh, and publications from a variety of communities, LBGTQ, uh, African American, and, and others. And so I'd be more than happy to get you in touch with the people that are running that project. They presented at a, at a conference that we sponsored at the Internet Archive uh, with the uh, Reynolds uh, Journalism Institute in the fall called Dodging the Memory Hole. Mm -hmm. So it was an homage to George Orwell's 1984. Right. And the subtitle of the conference was Saving Online News. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, uh, if we have the conference again, you'll all be invited. A small, a very small <laughs> game, yeah. Saving Online yeah. News. Sorry, um, <laughs> you know, briefly on the issue of choices, you know, the way that Wikipedia works is um, my, uh, my 
boss, Ben Vershbo, who was at the New York Public Library before he came to Wikimedia, uh, had a great phrase. He said, Wikipedia is kind of like an antidote to algorithmic supremacy. Because we have 200,000 editors each month making those choices on a case-by-case -case basis. <coughs> Just, I mean, in a way, Wikipedia is the result of millions of choices accumulated over time. Um, but those choices often come, as Mark noted, with a certain implicit bias. You know, our, we're drawing as well from our familiarity as editors with the top 100 sources. You know, oh, this paper we've heard of, um, it's the New York Times, great, we'll use it. Oh, that paper, it's a regional ethnic newspaper. Maybe we have no, no when I say we, I mean the, the, our, our volunteers. And this is where the demographics of Wikipedia becomes an issue because the average Wikipedian looks like me, um, you know, is white, is male, uh, nine out of, about nine, maybe eight if we're lucky, but more like nine out of 10 editors are male. The majority of the content about Wikipedia is written from people in the US and Europe about <clears throat> topics all over the world is being written from those regions. So what you get when you rely on familiarity and reputation to make choices is that if you're unfamiliar with something or if it's foreign to you or you just don't know how to read that language, because um, all language sources are accepted, are, are equally valid on Wikipedia, but if you're trying to verify or determine if this is a, a source with a reputation for fact-checking and accuracy, and it's you know written in Mandarin, and you're a 17-year-old who lives in Chicago, like what we get is implicit bias. What we get is systemic bias, uh, where we don't do a comprehensive job of getting all the world's knowledge because we make choices based on our, our right. background. Because all the world is not engaged in what you're doing. Yes. Is a, a, a way of saying that, which is a, and that, I mean, what, what's the way to address that? I mean, that, because that seems to me to be a really fundamental issue. So um, one example in, in my territory and then an, a, another organization, um, we're spearheading some initiatives to look more holistically at the citations on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia is this massive bibliographic layer um, with all the citation data, but most of the citations um, are not in a structured form, so we can't put them into our structured linked database, uh, which is a sister project called Wikidata. Um, but what we recently did is we ran some queries of every citation on Wikipedia that had an identifier associated mm -hmm. with it with it. So if it had a DOI or an ISBN or a PMID, um, we got 15.6 million citations and we released that as an open data set on Figshare just uh, last week. So now someone can go through and say, oh, okay, you have sources from, what is the distribution of language or what is the distribution of country origin based on your sources? Um, are the sources that you have about Nigeria all written in the UK? You know, you, we can start right. to ask some of these questions about where bias comes from and where it's missing. But right. the real leaders in this area on Wikipedia, although we're all working on it, is an organization called Whose Knowledge. And right. Whose Knowledge is specifically trying to make the internet more representative of the people in the world. Um, and, you know, with a focus on Wikipedia and addressing those gaps and biases. Right. Right. Um, I've got... Uh uh, we've got f just a couple of quick questions. So very quickly at the back and then at the front we can get, we can squeeze those two in. Yeah. Hi, uh, Edward Hasbrook with the National Writers Union. And I find the Wayback Machine extremely valuable, both as a writer and researcher and as a reader. And I would happily pay a subscription or per use fee for that material, provided that some of that money went through to the people who created it. Um, but we live under capitalism, for better or worse, in a system in which value is normally measured by willingness to pay. And I think it's really important to understand that it's, it's very hard for a news organization or a journalist to develop any market and a market-based medium for making available through a licensing service or a subscription service or whatever this kind of material when anyone who wants to can go to the Internet Archive and you'll make a copy and give it away. And I don't want to be too crude, but why should you... So I think it's important for people to understand the extent to which that work interferes with the development of market-based solutions. And I want to ask you, Mark, point blank, why should you get paid a salary for republishing other people's work 
and none of that money go to the creators of the work that you are republishing. Okay, so I, I will answer the question. I'm a librarian, yeah. uh, so I get paid because I'm a librarian, and librarians uh, make uh, copyrighted works available to benefit the public. I'll also say that not only do we live under a rule of capitalism, we live under a rule of law. And there is a provision in the copyright law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, that, that allows for rights owners to have materials removed uh, from libraries in the Wayback Machine in particular. And that we honor those requests um, every single day, multiple times. And I'll also just add that overwhelmingly, the support from publishers and others in the community for the service that we provide, a uh, complimentary service really for the services that they provide is overwhelmingly positive. Um, last question. So, hi. Um, hi. I'm Emmett. <clears throat> I'm going to be on a panel, so I'm really hogging the stage here. But um, <laughs> I, I, there's a question that I, I, I was recently at the New York Times, um, and I oversaw an archive consolidation effort, which involved rewriting the URLs of about 13 million articles. Um, and, <laughs> and, and I was curious. You know, we were thoughtful about it. We put yeah. redirects in place because we, we think that's important. But it seemed to me like that could be a problem for organizations like the Internet Archive and Wikipedia. Is that actually a problem? Canonicization of URLs, redirects uh, is a challenge. It's a challenge within the organization. You were probably doing it because you wanted to maintain the Google juice and maintain uh, the long tail of the, of the readership there. I dealt with problems like that at NBC News. We didn't always get it right. Uh, and uh, so I'd say, you know, when you talked about challenges, yeah. there's there are technology challenges, there are legal challenges, there are policy yeah. challenges, there are historical challenges, cultural challenges, et cetera, around digital archiving in general, and you've certainly highlighted on one of them. I'm just going to finish by asking you both the same question, which is what keeps you awake at night? What worries <laughs> you most about the world we're going into? Jake, I'll start with you on that one. Um, so, Wikipedia has a mission that every person should share in the sum of all human knowledge. And what keeps me awake at night is that there are, um, there's an increasing trend of leaders who think that the public should, instead of getting the sum of all human knowledge, should get a distorted vision or discombobulated uh, mess of distraction. Um, and I hope that Wikipedia, because of its editors, because of its community creation, can in some ways be a bulwark against the disinformation and fake news and spin. Um, but what bothers me is that it seems like um, sharing the sum of all human knowledge is not enough. You need to also educate people about how to determine and make literate choices about the media that they consume. And that's something that we can't teach them. That's something that needs to happen in every, uh, in every culture with internet access, starting from the time people are in elementary school, all the way up through college and journalism school, to be literate consumers of information, um, because uh, our gaps and our biases are being exploited. Um, okay. That's what keeps me up at night. Also insomnia. <laughs> I'm not surprised you have insomnia, I have to say. I think that that's... Uh... Uh, in your position, I would too. Mark? Well, um, I, mean, I got into this business in 84 um, because I wanted to re help reduce the risks of nuclear war. Uh, I, I'd worked in the Pentagon on nuclear war planning before that, and I was horrified with what I learned when I was there. So I started an organization for peace activists then. And, and, uh, and, and you know, nowadays, I'd say that uh, those kind of concerns, not just like you know, the existential threat to our species, but also uh, the injustice and horrors that we see in the world uh, every single day, and our ability collectively uh, as, as a society to be able to deal with those issues in the face of satellites and the internet and Wi-Fi and supercomputers and all of our pockets. The fact that this continues to, to carry on, where we have debates about what is true and what is not true and what is fake and not fake, etc. That keeps me up at night. And, I'm, and I, to the degree that we can work together to try to empower each of us with uh, an understanding of what's, uh, what's real and important uh, for each other and the way we can help each other uh, actualize in, in, in our lives uh, and, and, you know, and live a life of peace, those kind of things are what I'm working toward. Fantastic. Uh, Mark Graham, Jay Ulwitz, thank you very much indeed. Um, 
I'm, I have to I have to now get off the least friendly um, furniture for uh, <laughs> conference moderators, which is the high swivelly stool. Thanks very much indeed, guys. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over now, uh, just as we do this seamless transition with uh, with, with chairs to. Um, for, to our next panel, um, and then there will be coffee and sunshine uh, if, you, um, if you stay engaged. Uh, the next panel, which is Digitization and Preservation, the News Archive. Um, and I'm going to hand over to um, the person with the best name in uh, journalism education, which is uh, Catherine Boss from uh, New York University, uh, where she is the um, journalist, the, the librarian in the Journalism Library which I have to say, if you work in a journalism school, the librarians are the heroes. You get so many requests from students, and then you say, have you asked the librarian? And they come back to you and they go, oh my god, those people are amazing. They know everything, as opposed to the professors who are somewhat more limited in their knowledge. OK, and um, I would like to welcome our next panel. Um, we are going to be talking about digitization and preservation in the news archive and some of the challenges and opportunities of digitizing and preserving um, the news in the many different formats that it comes in. Um, we have some success stories and uh, some, a cautionary tale. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm very pleased uh, to be facilitating this conversation. Um, we have so much expertise and experience on this panel. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your stories. So um, uh, a little bit about myself, and then I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So I am the librarian for journalism at New York University. Um, and some of my research is also related to this kind of conundrum of how to uh, capture, archive, and preserve born digital journalism, and in particular, uh, data journalism which is a particularly thorny problem. And Mark Graham alluded to this a little bit when some of these data journalism um, projects have a front end and a back end that users uh, interact with when they're querying a database and um, they're uh, making kind of their own personal interpretation of a story. Um, there is no way, there's no systemic way right now for uh, anyone, libraries, cultural memory institutions, or the inter Internet Archive, to um, capture and archive these things. Um, so this is kind of the grim future <laughs> of this topic, um, and we're going to touch on it a little bit at the end. Um, but that's kind of what my research is related to and how I uh, ended up here. Um, and so now I'll have the panelists introduce themselves, starting with uh, Anu. Oh, oh you uh, your mic. Yeah, OK. Um, Hi, my name is Anu, uh, Anu Paul. I have been working in the area of digital preservation for the last few years, and I work on different projects, um, grant-funded projects mainly, uh, with the academic institutions and cultural heritage institutions. So one of the things that I worked with recently was the Fresh Air with Terry Gross, which is the NPR program, and the entire archiving of the program. And uh, it was, that was an audiovisual program that I worked on, and it was uh, an interesting project which I'll talk about during the panel. Thanks, Anu. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Abrams from the California Digital Library, uh, which is part of the University of California system. Uh, we are centrally organized to provide a variety of technology services out to the 10 campus library systems. Uh, my responsibilities there um, have to do with oversight of our initiatives in the areas of uh, research data curation and digital preservation. Hi, everybody. I'm Evan Sandhouse. Um, current, uh, uh, very recently, uh, I have joined the Atlantic. Uh, prior to the Atlantic, I was at the New York Times for about a dozen years, where I did several different things involving our archive. I think most interesting for the purposes of this panel, and I'll get into this a little bit more uh, in a few minutes, uh, I helped create a thing called Times Machine. Uh, that is our sort of online archive viewer. Uh, and I also helped lead the effort to consolidate our, our, our digital archive into a, a, into a more manageable set of more modern templates while making sure that other teams preserve the past. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to take this moment to say that at The Atlantic, I, am, I have an incredible opportunity to uh, build a team that's going to help us unify our understanding of our audience in a way that it hasn't been before 
And uh, if you are a talented New York City-based technologist who thinks that that sounds like a fun task, or if you're watching on the video, um, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We would love to have you join us. Uh, hi, my name is Michael Corey. I'm the data editor at Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, in the East Bay. Uh, we do a radio show that runs on, I think, 400 now public radio stations, and we do multi-platform investigations. Uh, the data team that I leave, that I lead, um, is primarily responsible for doing analysis that goes into stories, but also what in journalism we call news apps or interactives, and but really are sort of these slow food bespoke creations that sort of. Uh, don't fall into a traditional workflow and thus cause lots of problems that we'll hear about later. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks. Uh, thanks to the panel. Um, so Anu, we'll start with you. Um, you undertook a massive uh, digitization and archiving project at WHYY in Philadelphia to archive uh, Fresh Air with Terry Gross. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that project and um, the need to convert uh, audio visual resources to file-based formats? Yes, so, um, so just to give you a little bit of a background on uh, Fresh Air with Terry Gross. So the program actually started in 1976 as a three-hour local program completely. And <coughs> Terry Gross would interview archivists, um, w activists, as well as artists in the local Philadelphia area, and it would be broadcast in that area itself. It's only in 1987 when NPR started distributing the program, that it became a national program. And last year, um, the program celebrated 30 years of being a national program. Um, currently, uh, Fresh Air has a huge reach. I mean, it's, it's about 620 stations or something broadcast the program, and it's the podcasts downloads are supposed to be 3 million per week. Um, it's a and Terry has been doing this for now 40 years, and she has like, she's talked to everybody, all public <laughs> figures she has spoken to, and, uh, and, on, and a range of topics, whether it is literature, music, health, um, religion, she's kind of talked to everybody. And since we are in Palo Alto, I thought I will just read, um, since we are not doing sound bites, but uh, I thought uh, she interviewed Steve Jobs in 1996. And it was uh, on pushing for Apple to have a mouse along with their computer. And I'm just <laughs> quoting the interview, that, uh, <laughs> what, what Steve Jobs said. It was obvious that you needed a pointing device and that a mouse was the best one. We found that the people would push wrong button if there were three buttons, or they would look at the mouse instead of the screen. So we got it down to one button so that you could never push the wrong button. <laughs> but it was just the number of people and how she interviews. It's kind of made this program really special. And it's very unique, both from the historical as well as the cultural perspective. And keeping that in mind, it was WHYY really felt they need to preserve the program. The other issue being it's an audiovisual program, which means that most of the program that almost 1976 to about 2000, it was either on reel-to-reel -reel tapes or on DAT tapes. And there is a, you know, among the audio community that all these reel-to-reel -reel tapes started suffering from what is called the sticky shed syndrome. That is the, that is the binder that holds the information to the magnetic tape, starts deteriorating. And you, when you play the played back, you don't get the proper sound. And the same thing with DAT tapes. And the, the other issue being that the playback machines are not available at all. And no new playback machines are being, create, are being manufactured. So what you have is really old machines with, or refurbished mach machines. So because of this, WHYY decided that they do need to preserve and digitize. So they set up a strategy, and the strategy was really, this is the first um, archival initiative of WHYY. So I'm sure a like, lot of smaller stations also go through a similar model, and they had to figure out right from the beginning the biggest issue. Where do you get the funding from? It's digitization is really expensive. How do you get the funding? How do you, and what do you, digita what do you digitize? Do you, do you digitize the, the entire uh, 
unedited raw version of the interview, or do you kind of digitize and preserve only the edited version? These are some of the questions most of the organizations will go through when they're digitizing. I mean, and then how do you, how do you build the inf technological infrastructure to manage these assets? Um, and WHYY kind of just decided they would go step by step. So quite interestingly, they started with the digitization and they de decided to digitize only the air check. And the, they needed funds for that. And so they ran a campaign online and on air. It's called Save the Tapes campaign. And the money that they got from these Save the Tapes, they used for digitization. And that was a huge process because all these reel-to-reel -reel tapes, they had to be baked in the oven for eight hours. <laughs> And then they had to take the, they had to digitize. It was a long two year process to kind of get everything digitized. And after it was digitized, they, um, WHYY launched a second phase of the project, which is, just, which is creating a database to store this digital, digitized file, make them searchable, and, second, and finally um, export the data from this file so that they are available for researchers on WorldCat. And again, you know, they got the funding from CLEAR, which is the Council on Library and Information Resources, to, for this round. And, um, and again, there were several questions that came up, like what kind of metadata schema do you use for this? Uh, how, how do you kind of, uh, who, does the, who does the cataloging? Do you kind of, who does the backlog, especially like 40 years? And who's going to do the current catalog? And how do you make the project sustainable so that you don't need another grant later on to kind of re-catalog the new ones? Um, so we decided to, we worked very closely with the Fresh Air staff and we decided to go with PB Core uh, as a metadata schema and uh, one big reason was the PP Core handles descriptive metadata as well as hierarchical uh, metadata. And the way, if you've heard Fresh Air, the way the, way the uh, program is designed, you have an interview segment, which is followed by a review segment or an obituary segment. So we wanted a metadata schema that would highlight this aspect, the structure of the program. We worked very closely with the staff to find out what you know, what metadata elements we need to find, what, to pick what metadata fields we need. <coughs> and we kind of used a combination of controlled vocabulary as well as uh, local vocabulary. One of the things that was very important was to make the project sustainable beyond the duration of the grant. And for that, uh, we needed the Fresh Air staff to be very comfortable with what we were designing. We wanted them to add data uh, for the new new uh, programs, the new broadcasts that, that brought the new interviews that are broadcasted. So um, we we kind of we kind of worked with them to find out how to do this, like what kind of simple things like. They were not going to, I mean, uploading a file, and that was uploading the audio file. We just, they wanted it the easiest way to upload a file because they just wanted a drag and drop on the system so that, and it'll create, auto-generate the MP3s. They just, uh, because we wanted them to include it in their regular workflow. And finally, the last aspect was to export this data into WorldCat. And one thing that, uh, because both Terry Gross as well as Danny Miller really wanted all these things to be used for research purposes. And the WorldCat gives you the persistent URL, so it's easier for citing. And I just wanted to mention it to the person, um, the Wikipedia person who spoke just before this, Jake. Jake. Jake, that uh, we did a Wikipedia editathon, and we kind of added a lot of this persistent URLs on some, some of the Wikipedia pages. Um, so, uh, the project actually was completed last year, and uh, so through phase one and phase two, what we really did was to standardize the technical data for the audio file, standardize the metadata and consistency in applying the values to it, 
made a system which the production staff finds it easy to use. The production staff not currently um, downloads the audio files, they edit it, reuse the files for all their obituary segments as well as the rebroadcast segments. And uh, they're also adding uh, data to the new shows, uh, which are also getting available on WorldCat because it's getting harvested at the same time. And uh, the project is over now, on time, and hopefully everybody, and, ev and the entire archive from 76 to currently is available on WorldCat. Yeah, but on time and on budget. <laughs> 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 Wonderful, um, thank you so much. And I think um, it is interesting, <coughs> that question of where does the money come from? What are the incentives for newsrooms to do this or for other organizations to do this? What, where is this money gonna come from? I think this is gonna be a theme of yeah. this panel. Um, thank you so much, Anil. Um, so Stephen, uh, we can move on to you now. Uh, you have contributed so much to digitization and preservation efforts. Um, I don't know, probably a lot of people in this room are aware of this, but uh, Stephen was instrumental in the creation of the PDFA uh, standard, which is huge in libraries. Um, and you've also worked on a lot of other standardization projects. Um, can you just share some of your wisdom with us um, and talk a little bit about what do you think are the biggest challenges um, to problems facing news archiving today, and how might we all collectively address these challenges? Sure. Uh, I think it's important to um, offer both a, uh, a retrospective as well as a prospective answer to that question. Um, so, um, uh, building on, on what Anu was just saying, I think we could, we could talk about a real success story uh, in the area of digitizing and preserving uh, historic newspapers um, through efforts such as the, uh, the California uh, Digital Newspaper Archive at UC Riverside, um, its national counterpart that the, uh, coordinated by the Library of Congress, the, the National Digital Newspaper Program. Um, we're really opening up very large swaths of, uh, of the historic uh, news. Um, and in terms of the sort of the, the current state of the art in, 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 in digital preservation, um, we can be pretty confident in saying that we could essentially um, maintain this material in, in perpetuity. But we have the technical means to do that. Uh, as Anu alluded to, uh, the real problem is not technical, it is, it is financial. Um, we don't have the funds to do everything that, that we would like to do. Uh, turning from sort of um, uh, physical news to more digital news, um, I think, again, it's important to draw a distinction between uh, the way things were, say, 10 to 15 years ago uh, and the way they are now. Uh, to the extent to which um, online news mimics its uh, analog predecessors, uh, that is, it takes the form of static text, still images, um, something you can put in a PDF file, even audio and visual, you know, basically anything that can be put into a standalone, a standalone file in a well-known format um, that has a well-known rendering uh, technology. Uh, again, we can use a lot of the same techniques that we, we know how to do to, to preserve that um, as long as, as we have the resources to do so. Uh, when we talk about now, uh, let alone sort of trying to peer into the future, uh, things become a bit more problematic. Um, one of the things that you sort of get for free uh, when you go to digital is um, an incredible ease of mutability. Uh, and there was a lot of talk about that in, in the previous section. Uh, uh, Mark you know, had a, told us a little bit of story about the, the, you know, the rapid change in, in a New York Times article, and, and that we see that all the time. Uh, now, perhaps that's, that's really good regarding uh, the currency <laughs> and the accuracy of, of the news reporting. Uh, but what it means is that um, the news is this ever-flowing river, uh, and all we're trying to do is capture snapshots. So there's a real tension in trying to decide uh, how often do I need to come back and capture and recapture and recapture some, uh, any given news site to uh, ensure that we have a very fair intellectual representation of that site in, in the archive. And of course, that has to be balanced with just what is technically feasible. How fast can I go and, and, and actually grab stuff and once again, uh, how much can I afford? Um, every time you capture something, you're, the stuff that you're trying to manage gets larger, uh, and the cost of that uh, sort of goes up proportionally. 
Um, contrary to what you may have heard in, in, in the technology news, technology world, you know, the cost of storage is, has not gone to zero, and it's, it's never going to go to zero. Um, so when you start talking about things on terabyte, petabyte scale, um, it, it's, it's, uh, the financial considerations are, are, are significant. Uh, there is another fundamental problem um, in online news, especially that that is coming to you through various types of uh, social platforms, uh, which is that whatever it is that you are seeing may not at all be what I am seeing. Uh, there's this enormous amount of customization that goes on, um, as often uh, based on sort of this anonymous algorithmic decision making, uh, based on, you know, which is designed not to keep you informed, but to keep you on the website so they could sell your information, as we all know about now. Um, and those decisions have to do with who you are, where you are physically, uh, where you've been virtually, uh, and so forth. So there's this, there's this absolute intellectual dilemma of just trying to figure out you know, what is, you know, what's the canonical version of the news that, that we are going to try to grab and, 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 uh, and, and maintain. Uh, and lastly, uh, one more problem. Sorry to keep running through the problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that we're really living through uh, right now, even if we don't uh, always, it's not in the forefront of our minds. That is the transition from the web to apps as the medium of distribution. Uh, now the web is really, really big and it's completely decentralized, but it is an open platform. Uh, anyone with a browser can go and see anything that's been published, you know, subject to a, a paywall, but anything that's published is, is accessible to a browser. A web crawler looks just like a browser, so it's, it's easy for an archival organization, such as the Internet Archive, to go out and grab all this stuff. Uh, when you go and suddenly you're getting things on an app, on a handheld device or a wearable device, that's, that's, a, that's a closed platform. There's, there's no point in between the provider and the client to, to insert yourself to actually collect the material. Um, so, you know, absent some sort of a technological breakthrough in that area, the only way to archive that stuff is to, is to um, have the cooperation of the content provider th themselves, uh, which as we all know, are, are not terribly interested in that. Um, they're beholden to their investors, their shareholders, they're not beholden to the future, or at least they don't see themselves as being beholden to the future. Um, so that's, that's uh, not only is there a technical problem there, but there's this, there's this cultural, social, political problem um, that, that's really hard. Uh, technical problems are the easy ones. Um, it takes a little bit of time and effort, maybe some research and development funds, but as a colleague of mine always used to say, it, it's just programming. How hard <laughs> could it be? Um, questions and problems of scale uh, can be met with, um, we do this in the library world all the time through uh, collaboration uh, and cooperation. Uh, questions and problems of trying to engage with the content community that's a little bit outside my experience, but certainly it's going to require, um, you know, um, strategic coalition building, um, uh, very forceful advocacy, uh, and probably a lot of patient diplomacy. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, well, and we can move on to a success story. <laughs> Maybe uh, I was a afraid little I was going to be the cautionary tale, so I'm glad to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Evan, um, the New York Times has been referred to as the paper of record, historically. And um, Daniel Ockrens, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, he was a public editor at the Times from 2003 to 2005, and um, he had a very apt phrase, I think, for, for that uh, reference. It, that the paper of record is used as a compliment and a cudgel to the New York Times. Um, and I believe that that's very true because no one paper can be burdened with being the paper of record for the news of the day. But um, in, the, in this respect of taking its responsibility for archiving it, the New York Times' own history and in preserving its own record, um, thankfully, the New York Times took that very seriously. Um, so you were instrumental in the Times Machine work and also in overseeing um, this sort of digital archiving project at the Times. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and also um, 
maybe if you have some advice or insights on how other news organizations might follow suit, because really the New York Times is um, doing amazing work here. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, and I apologize to everybody that I'm going to be messing up my pronouns, because we, when I say it more properly, applies to The Atlantic, where I work now. But I was yes. at The Times for a dozen years, and it's going to be a hard <laughs> habit to break. Um, so uh, I think that the, the, the newspaper of record uh, comment is, is, is interesting and actually points to how long The Times has been invested in answering the question of how to best deal with one's news archive. Because um, as far as I know, that, that phrase was sort of came into currency around a project around archives the Times launched in 1913 called the New York Times Index. Uh, and the notion there was that there are quite a lot of other newspapers out there, uh, but the New York Times wanted to position itself as the newspaper that one referred back to in order to just settle matters of historical dispute. Uh, and to facilitate that, they created this uh, archival metadata source, the New York Times Index, to make it easy for people to find the things the Times wrote about. Um, so um, I think that compliment used as a cudgel um, is in many ways the fault of library scientists. So they, did, they, didn't, they, did, they, they did not call themselves that then. Um, in terms of the things that I've, I had the privilege to work on in the Times that I was, that I was with the Times, um, I think there's a couple of projects worth mentioning. One is Times Machine, and the other is some work we did around consolidating the content of our archives while preserving archival copies uh, of it. So Times Machine, I full disclosure, I'm often credited as the person who invented Times Machine. Uh, the name has been around longer than the project that I worked on. Um, uh, it was actually the name of another archive experience that was also based around uh, scanned archive pictures from 2008, but the name was too good not to reappropriate for the next generation of that. So uh, basically what uh, Times Machine does is it provides complete digital replicas of every single newspaper that the New York Times has published from 1851 to 2002, with exceptions for Sundays in the early period and days that there were newspaper strikes in other eras. <laughs> um, but the, 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 our, the idea was to take uh, the, the, the my, my frustration uh, and the, the frustration that sort of uh, led to the creation of Times Machine was I was working at the New York Times and I had access to an intranet and on that intranet I could see scans of every single page that we never published. Um, and yet, um, people who actually subscribed to the New York Times didn't have access to the same sort of information I had, but they were paying me, I wasn't paying them. Um, and I thought, well, that's kind of backwards. We should, w it would be really great if we could make this information available to the readers of the New York Times. And so the question then became, well, what does this information actually look like? And it turns out it was a bunch of one-bit TIFF scans at 300 DPI plus a bunch of metadata describing the sort of geography of each one of those pages in terms of where the articles were. Um, so the immediate impulse in making archival data available is like, oh, we'll just make a PDF of every issue. Well, turns out that it wasn't uncommon in the 60s for issues to have several hundred pages. Um, and um, I think a couple will tip the scales at more than 1,000 pages. It was not going to be, uh, uh, I, I'm told by the user experience people I've spoken with, uh, it was not considered to be a, a, a good user experience to download a 200 megabyte PDF that would then crash either your desktop or mobile device. So the question then became, well, how do we take this information and make it available to the public in a way that is that, that is useful, but also not sort of prohibitive in terms of its bandwidth costs. And so we, did, we borrowed a page from the online mapping community and used something called map tiling, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, to sort of decompose each one of those page scans into a bunch of 256 by 256 pixel tiles mm -hmm. um, that were then stitched together on the user's front end, depending on what part of the paper they wanted to see. Uh, that dramatically reduced the bandwidth costs and let us really serve the whole thing up in the browser in a way that felt natural to, any, uh, to anybody who has used a microfilm machine. Um, I, I am one of those people. Um, and um, we launched this in April of 2014. Uh, we launched a social media account around it in August of 2014. And I'm really happy to have seen the way that this, that this, that this has taken root at the times. Um, you know, throughout the time I spent, uh, spent with the organization, I was continually surprised by new people finding new things to do with our archive. And that to me was extremely gratifying. Um, and in terms of making Times Machine the success that, uh, you know, to the extent that it enjoys success, uh, I think the, 
key strategy there for making an archives project successful for a news organization is to really think hard about three things. Uh, the first is experience. Like, are you giving them a 200 megabyte PDF or are you giving them an experience that is digestible and easy to engage with? Um, so I think that's the first thing. Um, if it's you know if it's if it's a if it's a digitization of a radio show, are you providing that information in a way that's easy for people to get at? Um, the second thing is discoverability. Uh, an archive absent good metadata makes it a newspaper archive, especially like there's. I can guarantee the first thing that most people do when they get their hands on a newspaper archive is look up their birthday, and then the next <laughs> thing they do is like scratch their head and say, "Now what?" Um, and so I think you really need a good discover, uh, discoverability mechanism in order to draw people into that archive. And I think that takes several forms. One, of course, is search. The times we were lucky enough to have search that we could sort of supplant with our, or supplement rather, with our index metadata, which has been digitized and goes all the way back to 1851. So not only could you search for the word Apple, you could also search for the tag Apple Inc. and only get articles about the company and not the fruit. So that was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that you need to be able to have tools throughout your ecosystem to sort of circulate traffic to that archive. So related content modules, you know, really nice promotional modules that you can embed in your in your articles to not all, you know, so it isn't just a it, it, it isn't just blue underlined text. It's actually calling out like, hey, there's something special mm -hmm. here that you can interact with an experience. And I think the last thing is curation. Um, there, you know, it's great to give people access to um, 160 odd years of history, um, or 150, more than 150 years, that's, that's the Tizer Stream tagline, um, of history, but at the same time, it's pretty overwhelming. It's three and a half million pages, it's several, it, it's I think something like 13 million articles. How do you, how, how can you direct folks to relevant and interesting things? So we also started a social media account at MIT Archives where we um, made an attempt to look for things in that archive that might be interesting to our audience and call them out. Um, I think those three strategies, experience, um, discoverability, and curation are really key to making an archive project successful inside of a news organization. So the second thing I want to talk about, and I'll talk about it quick because I'm mindful that there's still somebody on this panel that hasn't had a chance to deliver their spiel, is um, a content consolidation project that we did. Um, and it was sort of one of the last things I worked on in the New York Times. So if you looked at the website and the data behind it for the textual uh, rendition of our archive, the digital text version, um, well, the Times has sort of three periods of its archives, 1851 to 1960, which is the deep archive, scanned microfilm, all you have is the lead paragraph, the first five lines of the article, and then, bad, and then dirty ASCII you know, bad OCR. Um, the transcribed archive between 1960 and 1980, where we actually paid a, a, a contractor to, uh, to essentially transcribe what was in the scanned PDFs. Uh, and then the Born Digital Archive, which starts in 1980 forwards. Um, and so those three different periods uh, had very different, uh, at least, the, at least the, the deep archive and the, and, and the transcribed archive um, had very different experiences on the, digital, on the Times Digital Properties. And that was confusing to users and it was bad because it made it difficult to implement, to, having multiple different kinds of story template um, from different eras of web development made it very difficult to position the entire sweep of our, 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 our archive well for search and social. I mean, websites often, news sites included, often launch redesigns prospectively and forget to make them retrospective so that an article from 2011 still has a 2011 template even if the new articles look really pretty. Um, and we wanted to eliminate that difference between articles on the site. That way we could, by hosting all the articles inside the most modern versions of our web frameworks, we were able to you know, narrow the scope of our concern in terms of optimizing for search and social and implementing things like AMP and, uh, and, and other you know, emerging things that news industries are being asked to do in 2018 that they weren't being asked to do in 2011. Um, however, we had to be mindful of the fact that there is archival value in the original digital rendition of these digital articles. Um, so another team, while I was busy trying to shovel all the data into a unified format, um, built this great uh, 
adjunct to the site called archive.nytimes.com, which essentially snapshotted all of the articles that we migrated into the more modern framework to preserve them in their original renditions to the extent that those still exist today, so that folks can see how you know the homepage looked uh, on, on September 11, 2001, uh, and not see and can see how those articles were actually presented to our audience in that in that context. And I think um, it, it's probably, I feel, the right compromise. Because a news organization has, uh, most organizations that I know of have constrained resources and need to focus almost everything on what's happening today. Uh, and I think that translates to digital. Like, you have the way that you display the news today. And if that's where all of your news back to the beginning lives, then it makes it a happy side effect that any improvements you make to your article presentation uh, you know, layer will ripple out to your archives if they're not sort of walled off in their own thing. Um, and in this process, a couple of lessons that I learned. Um, one, I hinted this in my question, is that you know, I came to regard the URL as sacrosanct. It, it, you know, it, had to, it, it happened to be the fact that the New York Times archive, 13 million articles were hosted on a domain called query.nytimes.com, not triple www.nytimes.com. That was silly. We needed to fix that. Moreover, the URLs were not human readable. Uh, they were just like, you know, basically computer readable IDs uh, instead of like your Moday headline kind of uh, URLs. So we wanted to make it a more approachable set of URLs. So we rewrote 13, actually, 13, the, the URLs for 13 million articles, but for a quirk of history, each article had four URLs. So we wrote in the neighborhood of about 50 million new URLs. We, uh, well, we redirected 50 million URLs to this set of 13 million new URLs that we created. But we were very mindful that the world depends on the sort of content ecosystem. Uh, the New York Times is a big part of that. And so if we broke all of our archive URLs, uh, I'm sure the community folks on Wikipedia would notice very quickly that like almost all the citations to the New York Times uh, <laughs> broke. So we wanted to be mindful of not breaking Wikipedia in this project. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and the other <clears throat> lesson that I'd say is that, to, you know, in my view, I could be wrong about this, there are folks that work cl more closely on this than I have, that the sort of preservation of interactives is still, is still a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. especially flash interactives. And I, I would liken the challenge there to the difference of preserving a stuffed bear and a living bear. Um, like it's much, much easier to, 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 to make sure that you know, the inanimate, not living thing is preserved in a way that is accessible to future generations. But software um, is not, it, it, the software is in you know, some ways a living thing. It requires security updates. It requires, it, it requires environments that know how to interpret it. And I'm still eager to hear about how we're going to be able to uh, indefinitely preserve software, given that you know, uh, computing platforms are such a, uh, such a moving target, much like real real tape machines. Mm -hmm. So that is um, my experience. And some of the things that I've worked on, I'm not checking my email. I'm looking to see if there's anything from my notes that I missed. <laughs> um, and I, I guess I would say that there are good reasons for both migrating your content to the most contemporary web frameworks that you have and for preserving the old versions of it. And I don't think it has to be an either or choice. Um, and I would encourage folks in a similar situation to at least do what they can to archive the old stuff uh, while still bringing in the new stuff. So that's my, sh my spiel. Um, <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, looking forward to questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, we'll just move on quickly to Michael. Um, so Michael, you currently build some of these interactives um, that Evan was just mentioning, the live bears. Um, <laughs> uh, they are some of the most complex news stories being produced today. Um, they require often teams of people and they have uh, complex uh, software dependencies that they're built on. So um, there is no current systemic way for libraries or memory institutions or anyone really to archive these things. It is kind of the pressing question of how we're going to address them. You've seen the loss of your work firsthand. Um, can you talk about how and why these stories are disappearing? Sure. I I'm pretty sure I'm the cautionary tale. <laughs> you are the cautionary tale. <laughs> Uh, no, I want to talk about a very important subject. Who has been to the Iowa State Fair? Anyone? All right. Who is a fan of West Wing? Does anyone know where I'm going with this? OK. Does anyone know what those two things have in common? It's the butter cow. Um, 
So for those of you who don't know, at the Iowa State Fair, there is a giant refrigerated case where every year they sculpt a cow that's completely made out of butter on a wire framework. <laughs> and then one other thing. So it's been The Last Supper. It's been Garth Brooks. It's been Elvis. <laughs> Garth Brooks and Elvis look exactly the same. Um, but anyway, uh, so as a video journalist at the Des Moines Register in a former life, um, I went to go do a video of the sculptor at the time. And you go in this big refrigerated case that smells like like, you know the butter smell in a movie theater, but like really old and rancid because they actually <laughs> yeah. reuse the butter? But so I was interviewing the, um, the sculptor, and I said, like, well, when did they start doing this? And she said, well, I have a book out about that. Go get the book and read that. I was like, well, thanks, Norma. Uh, that was great. Um, so I went and bought her book. Um, and there's like a little section there that says, well, my mentor was this guy, and there was one guy before him um, in the 50s, and that's all I know. And I was like, OK, I bought the whole book for this. Like, uh, but uh, since I worked at a newspaper, I went down to our library that Emily alluded to before, the big clip file of everything that we know, and looked up the butter cow. Because that, that, what she was saying just didn't make very much sense to me. Like that, I don't know, no one knows. I was like, all right, I'm pretty sure we know. So I went back and looked in the bound edition, and I, and I started finding references to the butter cow going back at least that far. And then it stops, I think, somewhere in the 40s. And so I went and asked the librarian, like, well, where's everything else? And she said, well, the only thing we have besides this is either the microfilm or you can go upstairs on the 13th floor and we have all the bound editions. And, um, and so I went up on the 13th floor, which is extremely moldy and gross, and found these old boundy, bound editions of the paper uh, and then that go all the way back to as long as they had it, back to when Des Moines had four newspapers. Um, looking, and I was able to trace it back to 1909, where there's a reference that the if you go back here, this is where the butter sculptures are kept. So to me, that implies that actually goes back even farther than 1909, because people presumably knew what they were talking about when they said the butter sculptures. But anyway, so we were able to push this history way back to, from the 50s to 1909. And I thought, I know what I can do. I can become the world's foremost expert on the Iowa State Fair butter cow. Um, <laughs> and so I built a little mini website about the Iowa State Fair butter cow that was amazing. It was pale yellow. Um, and like, I think I wrote it in PHP, and my editor said, you cannot put yellow on a website. And I said, no, it's butter, it's great, it works. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I built this website, and like, then I got contacted by people who were, building, or who were doing a documentary about butter sculptures. Things were going great. I was gonna <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so I moved on from the newspaper after, after a couple of years. And well, even while I was still there, we did one CMS migration, and the site made it to that CMS migration. Then I left, and they did another CMS migration, and a really hackneyed version of it made it into that version. And then uh, a couple years later, I went back and looked, because I was saying, whatever happened to that documentary that never got made? Um, and, I, and what's on the site now is two photos, I think, that I had found, and a link back to the Iowa State Fair's webpage, which has basically the same incorrect information that I was told by Norma like back in the day. So like, firsthand, I was able to see that our, we have Unfortunately, as a society, we know less about the Iowa State Fair butter cow today than we did than we did earlier, um, and that's the national tragedy. Uh, no, so, but to me, this is a perfect metaphor for for the for us losing things. And now, in my current life, I do sort of more advanced versions of those mini sites. And, there, and like, so one thing I, that I think comes out of this is why did that content not make it? I mean, a lot of the other content did make it. Part of the reason that content didn't make it is because it was a bespoke, special thing. It didn't fit into to our normal procedures. So like every, everything that was going in the paper was going through our content management system, the print content management, management system, and then to the web content management system. And that archiving actually happened at that earlier stage. And this was not getting captured by that archiving. Um, part of it was is because we were making stylistic choices that don't fit neatly into a grid, which is why it didn't migrate very well. Um, Software dependencies were like not that big of a problem. They're still PHP today, but the CMS is written in a different language. Um, anyway, so the projects I work on now, they tend to be really large uh, mapping projects or interactive projects. And the, the good news for archiving is even within the news apps community, there's been a trend over the last couple of years to be less and less dynamic and more and more static. To where in the past we may have run our content um, off of a web server, uh, that's generating the pages on the fly. Now, a lot, of, a lot of times, the best practice is to bake those files out and put it on S3 as static HTML pages. For the vast majority of projects, that works just fine. For some projects, it still doesn't work very well. And I feel very strongly that you shouldn't base your online experience on the 
on the, con the technical metaphors of an earlier age. Like if you're going to have an online experience, you should have an online experience. And so what that means to me is that like when we build, there, there are some things that it's not very easy to flatten out. Like we, uh, we just did a project um, on uh, housing discrimination across the country. And there's a map where you can look up every census tract in the country. So theoretically, I could bake out every census tract in the country. But that would not be the same experience that you get right now, which is you go on the site, you search your address, or you press the geocode button, and it zooms you in on the map um, and takes you to where you want to go. Um, I, don't think that, I don't think flattening that out would be, it doesn't give you the same discoverability as you get zoomed in and you say, oh, but what about this tract? And what about this tract? And what about this tract? So that's very difficult to flatten out. And so the question is, how do we archive those kinds of experiences? And again, I think some of the good news is, is I work very much in the open source software world, and everything I build is based on a large number of dependencies. And all of my work depends on the fact that I'm assuming that those will mostly work. Uh, so it's like, maybe that seems like a problem, but to me, it's a, it, it gives me hope that, for some reason, that does work most of the time. And I have to track those dependencies very carefully. And um, if I come back a year later, I will probably have problems finding those dependencies. But that seems like the solvable part of the problem, where like already on the internet, I have to, I am telling my software all the time when I'm when I'm installing security updates or upgrading, hey, go find version this of Psycho PG, which relies on this, which relies on this, which relies on this, and hey, it works most of the time. So that's that that is a difficult problem if I want to archive that experience, but it seems possible. The thing that I really don't know how to solve is when I mentioned that mapping uh, software. Those things all rely on external APIs. Uh, so I am, a, I am the assumption of this app to run is that the Mapbox GL API will continue to exist in the future. Because I'm not storing that. I didn't create that. I'm interfacing with something that they created and maintain on their servers. Mm -hmm. Same for the geocoder. The geocoder is based on the US Census geocoder, the Mapbox mm -hmm. geocoder. Could be the Google geocoding API. I don't really know what the Wayback solution is to that unless the Wayback machine is going, or, or Google, is going to commit that we are going to make the Google Maps API of this version available into the future. And, I, and, it, and it makes me very conscious of the fact that the internet we have today, the fundamental assumption is that it will be turned on. And, and, and especially for some, like the server clusters at the, at the scale of somewhere like Google, they have a profit motive to do that right now. I'm not sure that profit motive will continue to exist or will continue to exist in that same direction. So who is going to pick, who is going to be the archived Google running live? I mean, maybe, maybe in the future, the, the scale that we're talking about is not as big of a scale, but it's never going to be zero. And, and so that's the part I don't, unless someone is able to host archived versions of those live APIs, I don't know what to do about that. I, th I think. It, should we stop there? Or? Oh, and you can, no, keep, okay. keep, keep it, we have um, more time. I think, this, I think I do also get some hope from the fact that another, another trend right now in app development is containerization, uh, using things like Docker, which I find inscrutable and haven't figured out yet. But I think we are getting, the whole idea with Docker is you like build this thing and send it off into the world and it just kind of runs like a, like a zombie spaceship <laughs> and off into the ether. And, uh, the drawback to that is it's, it's a little hard to get information back out of there. And so like, that's one of the reasons we don't use those for apps that use user-generated content, for example. So like, unless you're going to store the data separately from the container, it's, it's kind of, uh, my, understanding is that, sorry, my understanding is it's a little hard to get that information back out. Other things about our, so <coughs> the other thing, though, is that I do kind of archive our work all the time on GitHub, like in a, in a sense. All of our code is on GitHub. We don't, we don't make all of it public right now, not because we have some big philosophical objection to it, because more just because most of my code, no one really wants my code. And if someone wants it, they ask, and then we give it to them. Like it's, it's just, um, but theoretically, GitHub has an archive of our code. GitHub does not usually have an archive of our data, or at least our big data sets. Uh, and, we're, and we partially do that for security reasons that we don't want. Um, well, one, we want to be lazy, and we don't want to have to filter out every tiny little piece of data that uh, we don't want to get onto the World Wide Web. We like to be able to not have to sanitize that completely, which if we put it on GitHub, we have to make sure we sanitize it. Um, also, just until relatively recently, GitHub didn't want you to host giant data sets on their site. They're, they don't care as much now, but it's just sort of baked into our, our workflow. Um, and also, it just makes your, your pushes take a really long time if your data is in their repo. 
Um, and so if we're gonna archive these stuff, these things, I mean, one thing is like, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, I, like theoretically happy, I'm not promising to do this right now, like maybe I can give you my GitHub account, like that's fine, uh, but you'll have to get the data separately, uh, you'll have to figure out the dependencies, you'll have to assume I did a good job of documenting those dependencies. Um, and, and I'm not, by the way. Um, and, but partially because like, there's two ways to, to, to do your dependencies. There's like, I want to freeze my dependencies or I want to keep moving forward into the future as the technology um, uh, increases. And we do a little bit of both. One of the main reasons we keep our dependencies go, going and I try to use the latest versions of everything is, is security holes. Uh, for example, we program a lot in Django and like, okay, so Django, you can't use Django 1.3 because now there's a security risk so you have to upgrade to Django 111, so now all these dependencies that worked over here don't work over here. Most of the time we can fix that, but sometimes we can't. So we do have a tension between, do we freeze it all at that moment where we knew it worked with those versions, or do we keep moving forward? Uh, so I th yeah, so I think there's some hope in, on the GitHub side or on the code side, but I just don't know how to keep these things running over time. So. Thanks, thanks Michael. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting the issue of the APIs you were talking about, and Stephen has mentioned this before too, is that these aren't static objects. They don't have well-defined boundaries. It's very difficult to say when it ends, when the object ends, and when a different one begins. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Google hasn't shown any interest in archiving their API. Um, but we have some time. We have about five minutes for questions, and I wanna give everybody uh, a chance to ask questions to the panel. Um, so we can take those now, questions or comments. And they're coming with a mic. Hi, so my name is Philip Skur. I'm the director for technical and access services here for the university libraries um, at Stanford. So, and I'm responsible for a lot of the metadata creation and I agree it is really expensive to do. So, as you were talking, I was thinking about the um, Grateful Dead archive at UC Santa Cruz and they have a fairly radical fan base and they've sort of crowdsourced the metadata creation to their mm -hmm. fans. So it seemed like Fresh Air could have that same sort of fan base. So I'm just wondering whether in the past or going forward you've thought about that sort of aspect of trying to maintain it in a very low cost way. Yes, that has, uh, Fresh Air has thought about it. And in fact, we do have a, we did create a field on PV Core, just, you know, PV Core extension field, just in case in a future date we do crowdsource and we will kind of use that field to uh, save that uh, data. Uh, the Grateful Dead archive, um, it, it has in fact been very successful in, in getting um, stuff contributed out from deadheads you know, all over the world. Um, that, all that material does get reviewed. It is subject to curatorial review at, at, at Santa Cruz. So it, it's, there's still, there's a bottleneck there. Hello, uh, Mark Jaffe from the Reason Foundation, NYU alumnus. Welcome. <laughs> um, I deal with the problem of um, trying to gather files from the internet that often don't have a specific URL. So it's not, it's not like a data journalism problem so much. It's a, it's a discrete file, but it's on the quote unquote deep web. Um, besides uh, Selenium, do you have any good solutions to uh, gathering that kind of information? On the deep web specifically, I don't have any experience. Is, is there something about, is, is the problem that they're on the deep web or the problem that you don't know the URL or what's the? Well, there is, there is, there is no URL. You'll right, go okay. Go to a form and it automatically mm -hmm. the JavaScript to generate a link. Ah, okay, yeah, I'm out of my depth on that one. Sorry. So I, I get plenty of airtime, but I do have a question because I, I don't know the answer to it, which is, does anyone that, and um, so moved was I by Michael's story of the butter cow, uh, <laughs> which I do now want a fresh air program entirely about the Iowa State Fair butter cow. But what's happening to um, local news archives? Because obviously one of the things that we've, you know, people like me who write about um, the changes to ownership structure in, in local news. You know, we, we, we've known that 
that there's an enormous consolidation in that at the moment. I don't know whether anyone on the panel has a, has a view of what's happening as Tronk and the LA Times are kind of imploding. Uh, did, did, what happens to the archive in that situation? I, I can tell you what happened to the Des Moines Register archive when they moved buildings. This was actually, and this was after I left, so I don't know a lot of details, but basically they get, got a hold of the Iowa State Historical Society and said, you want it, and they handed it over, and I'd, hopefully most of it made it, but I think they did throw a lot away. Um, from the clipping file, which, as you know, is like those things were just gold mines. And hmm. but unless you have a facility to keep them in that format, I think maybe it's a little difficult to to do that. So I don't think it's good the the situation. And especially um, their born digital archives, like the the archives of their website. Um, only the Internet Archive probably has copies of this stuff. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Time for one more question. Yeah, a question for Evan um, about the Times archives. Those are a commercial product uh, you can buy uh, per article, or they drive people as an incentive to subscribe. Maybe you weren't on that side of it, but I wonder, do you have any sense of how much revenue the archives generate in per article, or how much subscriptions are attributed to it? How does that compare with the cost? Is it a profit center, or is it a loss leader? So those are all great questions that I got asked a bunch of times in meetings, um, and, that I, <laughs> I, and that I actually do know many of the answers to. Um, but <clears throat> unfortunately, I, that, that, that falls under the th uh, category of things that I, they've asked me not to like, <laughs> be too specific about. Um, I will say that knowing the numbers, I was always happy with them, um, but I can't characterize it. I can't characterize it much beyond that. That being said, like I think that knowing the answers to those questions is absolutely foundational having a successful archives program. Like um, you will always, inside of a news organization, always, in my experience, you will generally find very strong advocates in the newsroom for preserving the archives uh, because. As we've heard, like that's their stuff, um, and they want they want it taken care of. But you know, prevailing upon you know decision makers in a resources constrained environment to like give you what you need to make this happen, you have to be able to answer those questions. I will say that I think that you know, for folks in their news organizations looking for things like this, I would go back through your most recent years and see like you know what percentage of articles linked to articles that are more than a year old, um, like. To what extent does the product, the quality of the product the organization is offering, the public depend on its ability to cite itself? Uh, and if it does, then that's a strong argument to make more, uh, to make a bigger investment. And one number I can share is um, I noticed four years after Times Machine came into the world, um, about you know one or two articles from the Times were linking to Times Machine every day. Now, you know, that's not, you know, as an organization that puts out about 200 articles a day, you know, that's not everything, but it's enough to say, hey, this is something that we rely on every single day to tell our story. Um, and so, like, yes, let's keep this, let's keep the investment where it is, or let's, you know, you know let's do the next thing. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, that's all the time we have for today and for this panel. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your stories. Thank you. Yeah.